talk about, you know, quickly, this is the Entrepreneurial Club, so talk a little bit about some of the things that we have experienced over time, how we started, how we got to the point of where we are, and the types of things that we, that we keep thinking about, because at the end of the day, it is all about evolution. Uh, we got into the business uh, back in 1904. My grandfather had a grocery store. Uh, he used to sell produce. He used to sell meats. had a very good reputation and didn't have an awful lot of competition from the early 1900s up to the mid-40s. And then all of a sudden, a lot of competition started to pop up. New supermarkets were open. They were much, much larger, and they had a lot of different offerings that uh, uh, you know, the small mom and pop stores didn't have. And so they had a difficult time competing. And so there was a cousin uh, that, uh, that my uh, father and his uncle and his brother had. And they said, hey, if you guys want to compete, you have to have some of the same nice so my, my, my father and his older brother left school and were helping in the grocery business and they heard about uh, fish markets. My father thought, okay, I'm going to put a fish market inside the grocery store. The problem was the grocery store is only about 2,500 square feet and really couldn't fit anything else in there. So we ended up leasing the adjacent storefront. Now in 1950, that's when he opened up the fish market. Uh, you know, you might argue that, hey, there weren't a lot of fish markets around. And, and, and the reason was, not a lot of people ate fish. You know, you ate fish because you're religious and had to eat fish on Fridays, or, so, or else it was something that was very inexpensive. So it was a business that sort of, you know, went in and out of the red all the time. I mean, Lent was the most important time uh, of the year for us. That was pretty good for Jewish people. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, but, but that's the way that in Fridays, Fridays were also good. But, uh, uh, people really weren't eating a lot of fish. It really wasn't in the DNA. It really wasn't in the culture. But what was in the culture was sort of the DNA. My grandfather had a very good reputation in the quality of the product. And so that was transferred to the quality of the fish. Now, what happened? Sometimes you're in the right place at the right time. This was Inman Square, Cambridge, back in 1950 up to the mid-60s. What was happening at that time is that there was a tremendous influx of Asians into the Boston-Cambridge market. And they were coming with their families to Harvard and MIT, and they were studying things like computer sciences. And they had very curious dietary habits. Much of what they consumed was fish, and a lot of it was raw fish. And so we had one of the few fresh fish markets around. And so people started to, to come to that market. I remember being a 10-year-old kid behind the counter, and people pointing to different cuts of fish, and that, you know, I'd wrap up for them, and then they'd just open it up and eat it behind the counter. You know, and, and sort of like, wow, that was like, this is well before sushi and sashimi became popular uh, here in the U.S. So that was one of the things, and there were a lot of uh, doctors and a lot of journalists started to study the Asians and say, you know what, uh, they have longer lifespans, longer incident, uh, lesser incidence, rather, of heart disease and cancer rates. So they were a healthier population, and that was attributed to seafood. So that was sort of the beginning of the seafood renaissance. <laughs> Uh, another thing that happened, again, sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, a woman moved into the neighborhood, and she started buying product from our market. And lo and behold, she started showcasing that product on her TV show. That woman was Julia Child. And so, again, it's sort of it's sort of in the right place at the right time, but, again, with the, the focus on quality. And the third thing that was, was important to us is that we were very close to the Boston Fish Pier, so we had access to the boats coming in. So the confluence of all three of those things was sort of the infamous to, the impetus to sort of launch a business. Now, now we fast forward into the late 60s, and all of a sudden my grandfather retired, and we had space. That same 2,500 square foot of uh, grocery space now becomes available. What do, you, what do we do with that space? And, we, you know, we, we sort of brainstormed as a family. Well, why don't we do a, a restaurant? Now, the irony of all this is none of us had a restaurant experience, any restaurant experience. We like to eat in restaurants. We used to go to IHOP on Sundays, and we would go to Chinese food every other Sunday. But that was our cumulative experience in the restaurant business. We did no fish, though. So what we did is we just sort of put out paper plates and picnic tables, and all of a sudden we opened a restaurant. Now, to be fair, there were not, in, in 1968, there weren't a lot of restaurants out there. 
there were restaurants out there, and, and, and where we were in terms of the price point was reasonably inexpensive. The thing is, if you know, if you go to open up a restaurant today, you learn all things like food costs and labor costs, and we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And that was probably one of the single more important things that we had going for us, because I think that if we had too much of a background, we would have had too many preconceived notions. We had no preconceived notions other than two things. One, the fish had to be extraordinarily fresh. And we had to be able to put it forth in a value. We, and we sort of kept the same mentality that we had from retail, although we, we never really articulated. And that was that what do we have to do to bring our customers back the next week? So that was sort of the mentality that got us, sort of launched us in the fish business. Like, I, remember we, I remember coming up with a dish. So I couldn't believe how many we were selling. We were selling, uh, I, I, I think it was a lobster casserole. And I, I, I was bragging to people, you wouldn't believe how many we were selling. It probably took me three years to figure out that I was losing about $8 on every one I was selling. So, you know, again, so we look back at that and what are, you know, how foolish can that be? But sometimes it's the stupid mistakes that sort of lay the framework and the groundwork for what comes <laughs> later on. So something to think about. Now, the, the next thing that, uh, uh, that happened, uh, and this was maybe, oh gosh, this was in the 80s. Uh, we had about five or six restaurants, and, and uh, uh, I went back to an executive education program, and uh, we had a really, really tough professor. Uh, and, and this guy, uh, you know, liked to torture his students. I'm sure this does not happen here, but they, they, they sort of ask questions, easy questions, would be thought were softball questions. And then he'd sort of slice off your legs, and, and you know, when you got up there, and it was sort of so. I, I tried to duck my head. I didn't want to tangle with this guy. And uh, but he saw what I was doing. He saw that I was trying to avoid his work. So um, in this program was for people who had been out of school at least ten years and were trying to figure out how to grow their businesses. So he just asked me sort of a question. He said, uh, "Berkowitz." And I said, yeah, "Yes, sir." He said, uh, "What business are you in?" So well, uh, so. Can't give him a smart ass answer. I said, well, you know, I'm in the restaurant business. And he just looked at me, he goes, Oh, you think so, huh? I'm like, How did I blow that one? <laughs> so he said, You're gonna go back, you're gonna do an environmental analysis of your business. And you're gonna you're gonna look at that as you look at your business past, present, and future. So I was the only one we lived on campus at that time, three weeks out of the uh, three weeks a year for three successive years. And so I was the only one that got the assignment. two pages, and uh, he didn't even open it up. He just kind of waved it in front of my face and waved it in front of the class. And he said, all right, Burke, which one business are you in now? I said, uh, I'm in the fish business. He said, oh, very good. You did your homework. And it was the single most important lesson I ever learned. So his message was, okay, you think you're in one business, but if you really focus on what do you truly do best, and what have you done, what have you not done to fully ex positively exploit the opportunity? And that's really the message on that. And that was sort of a guiding light because it was in 1985. And I've never forgotten that mantra. And it sort of underscored everything that we have done since that point in time. Now, let me fast forward ahead till maybe six years ago. Now, let me just ask a hypothetical question or, or, or just a, a question that you, you may be aware of. Now, growing up, do you remember a favorite restaurant or a favorite department store or any kind of a favorite store that's not there anymore? You think back to your hometown. I, I think we all do. Always, oh, what happened? And, and and you think to yourself, did you, the proprietors wake up one day and all of a sudden start you know, to decide to serve a, a bad product or give poor service? The answer is probably not. What happened is they probably closed down. They probably became obsolete. And the reason they probably became obsolete is that they did not change with the times. Now, one of the and that's a big big issue. In business, how do you evolve? Because at the end of the day, a lot of our guests, and it, particularly in the restaurant business, have a really nasty habit. You know what that is? They die. <laughs> and so you can sit there and say, "Gee, I'm wondering what's happening in my business. The sales are going down, and and there's natural attrition." 
So you have to always be proactive to focus on the next generation. What's happened? So uh, a, a few years back, um, you know, I, I, what I do is I sometimes hold um, uh, meetings with people, and I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take. Uh, I, actually, I don't, I don't even have any management there. What I do is I just take hourly employees uh, from the front of the house and from the back of the house, and we sit in a room and we just sort of brainstorm. And, and the feedback is unbelievable because these are people who are really closest to the guests and you get unvarnished information back. So uh, it was clear that one of the things I wanted to do was evolve the concept a little bit. And so I wanted to come up with something that appeals to 20 and 30 somethings. And um, uh, that was a little bit different. It was a little louder. It was a little bit more bar centric. The, the plates were a little bit smaller. And thus was born the legal uh, test kitchen, the LTK. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Down in the uh, in the seaport district, you have to wait till you go. Um, uh, but actually, you can go with someone, just don't drink. Um, but uh, so so that's sort of what happened, and the unintended consequence of that is we did attract the twenty and thirty somethings, but we also attracted forty, fifty, and sixty year old somethings. I could be in the company of twenty and thirty somethings. So it was sort of the first start of, of evolution. But so then, but but then the, the other things, how do you get word out? How do people really know what you're doing? And, and I would uh, suggest it really happens through marketing. So the, the decision and the thought process that I had to go through was, do you market to the same people who are dying, or do you market to the next generation? So you're going to see what happened. Hold on. Okay, so which yeah. Okay. So. So this was the first one. This was a maybe a four or five, yeah, well, 2008. So for almost five years ago, and and so what happened is we put, uh, uh, you know, some fresh remarks. Cartoon fish saying fresh things. Uh, and they got a little. So the one that got the most attention, believe it or not, was this conductor has a face like a halibut. <laughs> and apparently, the Commons Union were threatening to strike if we didn't if we didn't take it down. So, uh, uh, and um, you know, it must have been a slow news day because the Boston Globe picked it up, uh, and it talked about so this big debate about the ads. Now you can see, you know, the, the uh, you know the other topics of the day, but but apparently more people were interested in hearing about the legal seafood ads. So then. The, the, the uh, MBTA said we're going to pull them down. So now this is a freedom of speech kind of. So uh, so we ended up during this whole thing of sort of censoring the ads, uh, you know, is it, 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 kind of a joke. They still didn't think it was funny. <laughs> so so then uh, so then I did an apology. How do I do an apology? This one. Yeah. So this was my apology. Hi, Roger Berkowitz, owner of Legal Seafoods here. Some of you might have heard about the controversy surrounding our recent ad campaign on the city's subway cars. In order to illustrate how fresh our fish is, we put up posters with cartoon fish saying really fresh things. One ad in particular that drew a lot of attention said, this conductor has a face like a holiday. Well, I'm here to apologize. We made a mistake. It was a blanket statement and a mass generalization about conductors, and it was absolutely incorrect. We should never, ever have said this conductor has a face like a holiday, when the truth is most conductors don't look anything at all like holidays, <laughs> somewhat more like groupers. <laughs> I've even seen a few who closely resemble catfish, and there's one conductor on the green line that looks remarkably like a hammerhead shark. We feel very bad about this mischaracterization, and we won't let it happen again. Legal seafoods. If it isn't fresh, it isn't legal. That poor, that set them off. <laughs> so, so this was debated nationally on talk shows uh, about whether we had gone too far in the ads. So, so, the, so the thing had so actually uh, we took out a full page ad. We actually gave the Carmen's Union uh, X amount of dollars in gift certificates, and we mysteriously disappeared. Uh, Okay, uh, so this was the this was sort of round two. Um, some of these actually didn't make it. So, so for those who didn't think that we did some censoring, I actually did some censoring. I won't tell you which ones I'm censoring. 
Uh, these actually got sense. <laughs> Oh, these are the ones. Mm, okay. So if you look at these quickly, these actually were out in the Boston Globe. Well, this one on the left is, they yanked that one. Uh, Bethany Evans, loving grandmother and mother, passed away September 9th at the age of 88. After knocking on her door for 10 minutes, three sweepstakes employees, one holding a huge check, one holding balloons, and one holding a microphone, discovered her in her home. Too bad she didn't go to legal seafoods and eat more fish. She would have lived a little longer. Uh, apparently, the readers of obituaries in the Boston Globe do not have a sense of humor. And, and uh, it, it, this confused a lot of the elderly population. And, and, and they were truly confused. And finally, I got a call from the publisher. Goes, I got to yank them. Uh, and, and I said, well, you know, it's, it's actually interesting because fewer and fewer people are actually reading the globe. I mean, that's a statistical uh, truism. And and I said, these people are dying anyway, but at least you get new people to read. You didn't, you didn't see that point. So uh, that was the last of Bethany. Uh, it was actually a grandmother who was still alive, but in New York somewhere. Okay. Uh, <laughs> On this day in 1964, Captain Earl Melvin finally caught a fish good enough to sell to legal seafoods. To commemorate this occasion, the captain got a tattoo of an anchor. He also got a tattoo of two women riding a dinghy. But that was to commemorate a different occasion. <laughs> Some people don't have a sense of humor. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, the first one, uh, there was a member of my uh, family didn't like this one. And now, another fresh insight from Roger Berkowitz. President and CEO of Legal Seafoods. When you were growing up, your mom probably never tested your swordfish for purity. So don't feel bad when you put her in a nursing home. Legal Seafoods. <laughs> My mother said she was insulted. Legal Seafoods and you'll see wives of gas has rated us Boston's favorite restaurant. Or to enjoy our fresh seafood at home, just visit LegalSeafoods.com. I got to respond to it. No offense, but you bother Johnny demographic. <laughs> and now, another fresh insight from Roger Berkowitz, President and CEO of Legal Seafoods. If your wife can't take the time to test your tuna for purity, then why should you take the time to come to a complete stop before letting her out of the car? <laughs> so, legal Seafoods. If it isn't fresh, it isn't legal. Come visit Legal Seafoods and you'll see why the has rated us Boston's favorite restaurant. Or to enjoy our fresh seafood at home, just visit LegalSeafoods.com. Apparently, older demographics do not find this. And now, another fresh insight from Roger Berkowitz, President and CEO of Legal Seafoods. If your wife serves you tuna that wasn't harvested responsibly, the next time she asks, Does this dress make me look fat? Tell her the truth. No. It's the fat that makes you look fat. <laughs> uh, let's see, I, I got permission to co-brand this. I'm not going to tell you from who, though. <laughs> Actually, some people. Yeah, some some people are actually kind of offended by that. But then I got a call from the cab trunk company telling me that most of the drivers were born again and could I please keep them up. So that was interesting. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, this was one that uh, uh, first appeared in print. Now this was a little bit 
you've heard it, there's a lot of, uh, of discussion and debate about what's sustainable. And unfortunately, a lot of the people who <coughs> want to talk about sustainability sort of take it a little bit too far and, and sort of tell you that you really shouldn't be eating anything. So what I did is I picked two or three different species of fish which are absolutely sustainable. There's no debate over uh, but but framed it in a, in a sort of an interesting way. So, do, you, do you mind if I read those so everyone oh, is on the side? Sure. Yes. Um, so there's one on the left that says, save the crab. Save it to show that every creature is sacred no matter how small, or just save it so we can chop it up into tasty little crab cakes. <laughs> and then the one on the right says, save the salmon. Save it so our children can witness the grace and beauty of this not, not noble fish. Or just save it so we can saute it with our fa uh, fabulous lemon chive butter sauce. <laughs> just trying to keep it in perspective. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is how it, it, it appeared uh, in... Uh, uh, Save the crab. Save it to show that every creature is sacred, no matter how small. Or just save it so we can chop it up into tasty little crab cakes. This message brought to you by Legal Safety. Okay, so we, it did actually go out nationally on USA Today. Okay. Uh, this was kind of an interesting one. Save the salmon. Save it so our children can witness the grace and beauty of this noble fish. Or just save it so we can saute it. <laughs> New ads by the legal seafoods restaurant chain challenging political correctness. The restaurant chain not worried about who they offend. Our panel is back. Amelia Antonetti, Lee Hawkins, and Erica Payne. Amelia, I'm shocked I, that you think these commercials are, I think these commercials are hysterical. You don't think they play with the public. Why not? I, you know, I, really, I think, especially given where we are right now with the economy, I don't think it's going to drive customers to go through and sit down and have dinner. Um, and right now, that is what the main focus of a marketing campaign is. Will it bring somebody into my restaurant to sit down here and eat? And I think it's going to cause controversy, and it'll be talked about, but I do not think it's going to bring customers. All right. I, I, Lee, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to jump over you for a second, <laughs> Erica, because usually Erica and I are on opposite sides, although we agree the bailouts were bad, but on this, we agree. You like these commercials as well as I do. I love these commercials. They are so funny. I laughed out loud when I read them. And if I, I mean, especially in the... In the wake of all of these bad things happening, a little laugh, a little giggle, and look at all the free press they're getting. I think they're brilliant. But are you going to go eat there? Are you going to go eat there? Well, when I was I was in Boston for a, about a year, and I went there as Jimmy. Lee, is it a smart market? It's justifiably, folks, find that conservation is that imply that all seafood is in danger. And salmon, trout, and crab, they are not in danger. <laughs> I think Particularly, by the way, we have these horns. Yes, yeah, yeah, there's ample supply. supply. And where it falls short is it doesn't give those statistics. It doesn't educate the consumer. They say they wanted to educate the consumer, but they don't. They just do. So you think they could go the one line? Maybe, I think they, they could. could one would have uh, political. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so these are, uh, are actually, these, this has just been running on, I don't know if you've, if you've seen them, but uh, these are meant to offend no one, but apparently we've succeeded in offending a few, so you be the judge. <coughs> wow, sure is secluded. Just you and me. Have you ever seen Brokeback Mountain? No. No, never. It takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Some time to ask this This is my favorite. You have to listen closely. Nothing makes your grandpa feel more alive than fishing. Can we come here again tomorrow, Grandpa? <laughs> Spend some time with us instead. <laughs> Two other quick ones. The end of that one, you're a splash. A great boat. Where 
Where'd you get it? Garage sale. Ten bucks. You believe that? Uh, they don't make them like this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time to catch a fish. Spend some time with us instead. I can't believe you finally took me fishing. Yep. I want to learn everything. Right, Ew, are those worms? Well, it's so hot. Okay, I'm nauseous. But, I can't believe you took me fishing. <laughs> it takes a long time to catch a fish. Spend some time with us instead. So there are people that take some of these things personally. The idea is not obviously to create uh, you know, a, a, a division amongst people coming to eat with us, but eat with advertising today, I mean, the, the people who, the older generation, really grew up watching uh, Disney's Wonderful World of Color, and, and the next generation, you guys, grew up watching South Park, so you have to vary the messages, and, and, and yet the, the DNA of what we do has to remain the same. So thank you very much. I'm happy to open it up for questions. So just raise your hand if you have a question, I'll come around with the mic. Who wants yes. to take it off? Oh, there you go. So what would the impact of all those marketing campaigns be so measurable? Um, yes, I think it was measurable, and we start to see a lower demographic, uh, you know, coming in. Now, I, I, I just got it. Let me see if I have it today, because I'll read it verbatim. Uh, what happened? Hold on. I, I still get, you know, some some people who fail to see the humor. Uh, behind it. Let me see if I can find one here. Uh, here. Uh, I am upset about two com radio commercials I heard on 10.30 a.m. WBZ Saturday, 3, 9, 13 at noon, and perhaps 30 or 60 minutes later. She's taking really good notes. Uh, in the first, you encourage my death. By suggesting a family member take me for a long walk, a, a long walk off a short pier, as a mother-in-law. Uh, while the second commercial says how much you hate women, by suggesting if you think your shellfish is bad, give it to a woman and see if she what heals over, throws up. If nothing happens to her, you can safely eat the shellfish. You show how little you want me or any woman or customer. Don't worry, I'll never sit foot in your restaurant again, and I will tell all my friends especially the women that you promote um, uh, harmful actions against and that you should never have anything to do with ever. You should be thoroughly ashamed of these commercials. So I do get some, some, some feedback on them, uh, <laughs> not all positive. Uh, and, but you see what happens, I mean, sometimes when they hear something in an ad, I mean, these ads are clearly tongue in cheek. But what happens is sometimes in a politically correct society, you measure every single word and say, how does that impact me? What am I supposed to think? What am I supposed to do? And so the idea is you, you can, you know, I, I think a lot of people go and, and, and end up taking the wrong conclusions on it. But it does open it up for debate. And it does suggest what is politically correct and, and what isn't politically correct. I mean, you know, should people have a sense of humor over? I mean, if, if we come up with vanilla ads that say, oh, our fish is good, you should come eat it, everyone's eyes are glazing over. You know, we're, we're trying to make a point about what we do. And if humor, uh, or edgy kind of humor kind of at least allows you to connect the dots. That's something that, uh, you know, at this point, I'm willing to take a risk on. Um, and that kind of goes towards, or this kind of goes towards what you were saying at the end, but are you ever afraid that you'll piss off the wrong group of people? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of, what kind of, you know, gives you the courage to say, Screw it. We're going to air this anyways. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. We use a very uh, edgy ad agency uh, out of New York City and uh, a very, very clever group of, of folks down there. And, and we talk about if we th are we pushing the envelope too much on it? And again, we always try to remember, what is it that we're trying to do? You know, uh, who, who, who are we trying to connect? With? And, you know, uh, there is a certain portion of the population that may be offended by the ads, but they like what we do inside. And so, yes, you know, you sort of, you know, I, I hate to use an analogy because this is a, a really terrible analogy, but every so often a plane goes down and people go, I'm not flying that airline anymore. And what happens? You know, well, it was a convenient time. It was only one, you know, so, they, so they, they will. And so you weigh certain things against have you gone too far. There is no intent in any of these ads 
to be mean or mean-spirited. They're all done to be tongue-in-cheek. It's not to promote one group over another. That is not the context of it. And so we kind of vet it out. It goes through, I think, a fairly you know careful vetting process. There are times where I have to step up. I just don't feel comfortable with that. Anymore, so. Yes? Uh, whose idea was it to have your voice in pretty much all of the campaigns? Uh, well, uh, let's see. Well, I, I'll, uh, I, that's a good question. Um, I had done it over a period of time, and, and my background was actually in radio. So it was cheaper, actually. <laughs> so, but so over time, you know, regardless of the demographic, the age group or whatever, you know, really since the seventies, and people have been used to hearing my voice, so it was identifiable. That's somebody from the sides or the back. Here we go. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm um, just wondering where do you look to get ideas and inspiration on a daily basis? Do you uh, read or do you talk with people? Very good question. Uh, yeah, all of the above. I mean, you know, uh, my, uh, my one of my former marketing professors used to say, just walk around, walk around the mall, walk around, uh, keep open. Yes, certainly uh, read, talking to people, travel. Travel is very important. Uh, no one has a monopoly on the best ideas. And so, you know, uh, I, I think just sort of getting out there. The other thing I, I, I do, and some do, some don't, I, I like to meditate. And, uh, you know, it sort of calms me down, and, and I can focus on things. It doesn't make me any smarter, but sometimes it helps me to connect the dots a little faster. Another question? Uh, what's the craziest reaction you've ever got to any of these ads? Oh, oh, gosh. Um, well, you know, uh, sometimes uh, colorful language in, in uh, you know, in emails. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, that's, oh, oh, I know, yes, okay, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the craziest. Uh, I, I got a call once from an elderly woman uh, who saw a truck outside one of our restaurants, and she said, I don't think that's right. Uh, I said, what do you know? What, what don't you think is right? It says, man, you smell like crap. And I said, look, Mom, it says, man, you smell like carp. So. <laughs> um, so my question is, as a student entrepreneur, or as, you know, or a startup in the early stage, is this type of marketing a good idea to do? As, you know, is this a good risk to take? Or since you are a larger, you know, corporation, do you have... Are you able to take these risks? You well, you know, the, the tendency, here's the tendency. It's a good question. It's a fair question. I think the tendency is, as you've been around a long time, to become risk adverse. Exactly. And the biggest risk in business is not taking it. Because you can be complacent for a certain period of time, then you're going to fall off. So if you're going to decide to be in business, uh, you really have, it's, it's a continuum of taking risk. You don't have that one great idea and you're set for life. I mean, you know, the, those cases are few apart as well. Any matter? Here we go. Danny, that's back. Um, so, so the ad campaigns are great, but personally, why do you think people come back to your restaurants? Like, what? Why are you guys still in business? Uh, well, I, I think it's the quality of the product, you know, and it, and, and 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 so the campaign. Doesn't drive people in with you know twelve ninety five or twenty two ninety five specials. It drives them in hopefully as an image campaign of, of and it's very simple, really fresh fish, and that's what we do. That's our point of differentiation. You know we are in the fish business. Uh, you know we source, handle, and value add our product. That, that's that's you know, we have a laboratory, we do testing, so you hear those messages uh, in there. And so that's really the, that's why I think people come to us. If they come to us in such a way that the ads are being discussed, before we were doing this, we had perfectly nice ads, but I never had the ads debated. It was never, you know, a, a point where, uh, of, of interest where three people said, I like it, and one said they don't. You know, that's great dialogue. You know, I want to get people talking about it because it allows me to explain what we do. So you're talking about going after the younger generation. Over time, 
your menu has changed. Is that because of the taste of the generation, or is that just with the times and? Yeah, I, I think uh, you know certainly uh, you know one of the things that you know up to a certain point, say the '80s, things didn't change with much rapidity. But I think when people when technology became more advanced, people started to travel more. Their experience level started to change. That's when things started to accelerate, not just for the restaurant business, but but in general. And so, you know, people who are coming to us have been to Asia. Uh, they they've been all over Europe. They they've been to Scandinavia. They had sort of these experiences. And so it was up to us to to try to really anticipate what it is that they wanted and sort of keep out ahead of it, not to sort of be reactionary. So we we sort of had to get in their head a little bit. Um. Um, I was wondering how easy or hard it was working with your parents or your family, and how would you deal with the older, older generations when we have problems? I got rid of them. What <laughs> 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 if they didn't want to leave? No, excuse me. It, you know, it, it's a good question, and really, uh, you know, family businesses in terms of the su succession planning, how do you do it? I got two. My uh, my two oldest are in the business with me uh, right now. They're in different ends of the business, and so I try to take. What worked well in my generation, or what didn't, because in my generation I had another brother that I was involved with, and that did not work out so well. So we try to figure out what you know, sort of a plan of, of what works and what doesn't work, and then as a family we keep talking about it. You know, so it's a constant thing. I don't think there's you know a panacea for doing it. In some families it works well. Um, and, and others it doesn't not. So sometimes it has to do really with the family dynamics and the mindset of the old generation in terms of how willing they are, you know, to to give some freedom out there and and to allow for some experimentation. So I'm I try to be mindful of that, uh, you know, with our kids and and sort of see where it goes. And so I I think we've had some great discussions over it. But you know, it, I mean. It, it, six, uh, succession from one generation to the next uh, is always there. Are always pitfalls out there. there. There's not one thing that works for everyone. We have time for one more question. Send it back. Hey, thank you for coming. So you focused on evolution throughout your speech. I'd like to know what kind of systems you have set up within your organization to anticipate changes and then react. Well, you know, we, 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 talk, uh, we talk about change a lot, and I think that has to be embedded in, into the DNA. And so, you know, I, I, one of the things that we have in place, I, I, I mentioned before, I call it the, uh, the, the President's Advisory Council, which is uh, a lot of people at different levels in the organization. Some are associates that are working directly with the guests, some are in the kitchen, uh, and then we will we'll move it up to a, a lower management group. And, and so I solicit a lot of uh, input all the time. And and then sometimes I'll see something, but I'm not sure if I'm seeing the right thing, so I'll throw it back on them for their feedback. So there's like a continuum. I mean, I, I suppose in some ways, uh, you know, it, 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 it's an opportunity to blue sky stuff, you know, back and, and forth all the time. But you can't, if you have a preconceived notion of just how something should be done and you close yourself off to other ideas, then, then it's a crapshoot. You. you might be right, but you might also be wrong. You might not see something. And I'll give you a perfect <laughs> example of it. Uh, it goes back. Does everyone know the Polaroid Corporation? All right, the Polaroid Corporation back in the 60s and 70s was an outstanding, innovative organization. Okay? I mean, they, you know, not the cameras. So I was fortunate enough to know uh, Dr. Edwin Land. He was the founder of Polaroid. And he was a brilliant guy, uh, an absolute brilliant scientist. He came up with the Polaroid glasses, you know, and he came up with that idea for the Navy during World War II when they looked up so they could uh, distinguish where the planes were and what kind of planes there were. And just, just absolutely brilliant. And he was behind most of the innovation over the years for Polaroid. And he had an idea, and I'll, I'll never forget, he was all excited, he was telling me about it. He had come up with a system, a video system, and it was all integrated, the camera, the film, the screen. And it was, it was brilliant, but Sony and others leapfrogged him because he had the right idea, but the wrong application. And so that's why 
if you have a good idea, you've got to vet it with people you trust to come back to give you the right sort of input to make it better. All right. Yeah, with that, let's give Roger a big round of applause.